Hello and welcome to this new podcast, which we're calling Rejoice. Every week here on my website, www.frankdelaney.com, I'll spend five minutes talking about James Joyce's mighty novel, Ulysses, and sharing with you my own unraveling of it. Why? Well, why not? You could say, why bother? And I'd say, for the sheer fun of it, because this is a book that has engrossed and delighted me for most of my adult life, and I know the enjoyment to be had from it. And I also know that such enjoyment has been denied many, many people who would read Ulysses if they weren't so daunted by it, and indeed who tried to read it and had to give up. How do I know this? Because I was one of them. This is beginning to sound like an infomercial. And wouldn't Joyce himself, the arch purveyor of the language we speak, wouldn't he have loved infomercials? So think of these podcasts as my Ulysses infomercial. You see, when I found that I had tried and failed to read the book, I decided this isn't good enough. Life is too short for an Irishman not to know Ulysses, especially an Irishman who knew every stick and stone of Joyce's Dublin. After all, he gave such a detailed portrait of the city in the novel that he said if Dublin were ever knocked to the ground, it could be rebuilt from the pages of his book. So I figured that if I had to write about Ulysses, I had somehow to finish reading it. I came to that conclusion just in time for the centenary of Joyce's birth. He was born on the 2nd of February, 1882. Now, it wasn't that convenient for me. Commercial or not, I had to read the book. And after settling down and focusing hard, and from time to time reading it aloud, I found myself loving it. And in the book I eventually wrote, James Joyce's Odyssey, A Guide to the Dublin of Ulysses, here's how I described the experience. Now, hold on, let me find the page. Here it is. Reading Ulysses is one of the pleasures of life. It is a vast, entertaining, funny, absorbing, exciting, complex, immensely enjoyable novel. A book to get lost in. A book to take to a desert island. A book to keep by your bedside and discover each day something new. A book to be quoted from, recalled, discussed, contemplated, bequeathed, bestowed. Above all, to be relished, savoured. A work of intelligence and delight. But ever since it was published, on Joyce's 40th birthday, generations of readers have faltered. Joyce's novel is still, to many, a literary obstacle course, and the reader whose stamina fails often feels guilty. I wrote that nearly 30 years ago. I think it still stands. And hence, these podcasts, which we're launching this week to coincide with Bloomsday. Bloomsday? What, you may ask, if you're not a Joycean, and I mean to make you one, what is Bloomsday? Here we go. On the 16th of June, 1904, a brilliant young Dublin literary intellectual had a first date with a dark-eyed hotel maid. They met on Nassau Street and went for a walk, literally walked out. And the young man, he was 22, went on to write a novel that reflects as much as he could gather of what happened on the streets of Dublin on a day that was to become monumental for him. His name was James Joyce. Her name was Nora Barnacle, a country girl from the west of Ireland, and they lived happily ever after. Well, up to a point, he was at the time something of a layabout, and he liked to refresh his throat a lot. He said of himself later, I'm a man of small virtue, inclined to extravagance and alcoholism. Nevertheless, Nora stayed with him for the rest of his life. The novel, as you've guessed, was Ulysses, his hymn to her. And the main character who wandered through Dublin as Homer's Odysseus wandered the ancient seas has the name of Leopold Bloom, a decent man. And you'll be hearing a lot about him. So the 16th of June, 1904, was Bloom's Day. Let me pay attention for a moment to the name Ulysses, and then I'll tell you what to expect in the weeks ahead. Ulysses was a popular name for men in the last hundred years or more. Think of Ulysses Grant in the American Civil War. It's the Latin name for Homer's great wanderer, Odysseus. His name, some say, means angry, or the man with the wound in his thigh, which could make him angry, I guess. He was some man, the same Odysseus. He was the one who came up with the idea of the Trojan horse, pretending that this huge, magnificent wooden horse was a gift to the king of the city under siege. And then they took in the gift, and they found out that there was a bunch of soldiers hidden in there. After the Trojan Wars, Odysseus set out on his journey home to his own kingdom, but he kept being deflected, and the journey took ten years with many, many adventures, all of which you'll hear about on these podcasts, sometimes sentence by sentence, because every line of the book contains a depth of rich, brilliant reference. 
In the novel Ulysses, Joyce follows the framework of the Odyssey, and every chapter conforms to a chapter of Homer's. Though Mr. Leopold Bloom is nothing like Odysseus, it is glorious. Join me here on this Joyce cast next week as we start to go through the book in detail. Episode 1. We meet the Buck Mulligan. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney, and welcome to this, our first step right into the novel Ulysses by James Joyce. Let me set it up for you briefly, and then we'll start looking at the text. The poet William Butler Yeats, a contemporary and admirer of Joyce, said that Ulysses was the vulgarity of a single Dublin day prolonged to 700 pages. If we take Yeats literally rather than critically, he was spot-on accurate, that is, if you look at the essential meaning of the word vulgar. It comes from the Latin word vulgus, meaning a crowd, and thus vulgar breaks down to mean of the common people. And that is surely what Ulysses is, a novel about the common people of Dublin as they went about their business on Thursday, the 16th of June, 1904. Joyce himself said there was nobody in any of his books worth more than a hundred pounds. And his main protagonist, Leopold Bloom, who doesn't appear for a few chapters, was certainly not a wealthy man though he is now world famous, and his great day, Bloom's Day, is celebrated in many countries every year. In 1904, in Dublin, halfway down the east coast of Ireland, it was what they call a nice day, and so the book opens in sunshine. Some young men have been staying overnight in a curious building by the sea, a Martello Tower on the south side of Dublin. Martello Towers, the name comes from a fortification near Geneva in Italy, they were built by the British along the coastlands of their empire to defend against Napoleon. And at this Martello Tower, at Sandy Cove in Dublin, morning has arrived. In other words, Joyce begins his novel when dawn has broken. And here's how he opens it. Here's the first sentence. Stately, plump Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead bearing a bowl of lava on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. Okay, hold it right there. And from the very first sentence, I can begin to give you an idea of the depth of reference that Joyce plays with. Let's take the first word stately. And, keep this in mind, it's followed by a comma. You can make at least one other word from stately. And Joyce was very anagrammatical. What's the other word you can take? Yes. And famously, that is also the last word in Ulysses, but we're a long way away from that. As to the meaning, here's the point. Stately means dignified, especially in ceremonial. In important processions, people adopt a stately way of walking. But here, the word stately is followed by the three words plump buck mulligan. Nothing stately about the word plump is there. In fact, it's a term you poke fun with. So here's a man with a stately walk, and he's called Buck, which indicates some capacity to royster. And he's plump. So what's going on? If you ever want to understand multitasking in prose, James Joyce is your man. Every sentence in Ulysses has more than one meaning, and sometimes many meanings. Here, he's poking fun at this character, Buck Mulligan, who is something of a fun poker himself, which is why his walk is stately. So the man doing the mocking is also being mocked, and that will be the case all through the book with the buck, whose full name, Malachy Mulligan, is based on a Dublin doctor called Oliver Gogarty. Note the syllables, Oliver Gogarty Malachy Mulligan. In real life, Gogarty, who was something of a buck himself, a bit of a rake in his student days, taunted and teased Joyce and generally mocked him. Ulysses is in part a novel of revenge. Now, why the stately walk? It's because Buck Mulligan is mocking something sacred. He came up the stairs of the Martello Tower, out onto the parapet, walking like somebody in a ceremony, and, here's the quote, bearing a bowl of lather on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. What is he up to? The Buck, in Catholic Ireland, is mocking the entry of the priest into the sanctuary from the vestry, or the sacristy, at the beginning of Mass. The priest would typically have been carrying a chalice with a pattern on top and the veil that covered it, and he would have been holding this chalice in a precious way to indicate its importance in the bread and wine ceremony of the Mass that he's just about to celebrate. But Mulligan, and this is just the beginning of the many reasons why Joyce was called a blasphemer, is not carrying wine that will be miraculously transformed into the blood of Christ. He's carrying a bowl of shaving soap. 
Sure enough, the mocking goes on. Here are the next two sentences. A yellow dressing gown, ungirdled, was sustained gently behind him by the mild morning air. He held the ball aloft and intoned, Introibo ad altare dei. And there you have it, as plain as a white plate, Buck Mulligan's first words come from the opening of the Latin Mass, which Joyce had heard every Sunday and high holy day of his young life. And yellow, of course, is a colour worn in priestly vestments. And yellow is the colour of memory. And Ulysses is one of the greatest novels of memory ever written, because Joyce had long left Ireland when he wrote it. Yet the topographical detail is extraordinary. Streets, even houses, are recorded accurately. There we go. That's our first paragraph. In next week's podcast, The Mocking Continues. Rejoice, Episode 2. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. In last week's podcast of James Joyce's Ulysses, we met the notorious mocker, Buck Mulligan. If you remember, he had appeared on the parapet of this tower they were all staying in south of Dublin, and Mulligan was putting on the performance of mocking a priest saying Mass. Now, I left you with a note about the colour of the robe he was wearing. It was yellow, and I said that yellow was the colour of memory, because Ulysses was a novel written from Joyce's own memory. But yellow is also the colour of cowardice. You remember the cowboy movie dialogue, You yellow-bellied rat. So Joyce really meant to take it to his one-time pal, Dr. Oliver St. John Gogarty, on whom he based Buck Mulligan. Gogarty's crime? Well, we'll come to that in due course. And my sympathies are with Joyce. They're not always, but in that case they are. And by the way, Gogarty said later that Ulysses ruined his life. Maybe the novel was the very reason he left Ireland and went to live in the United States. In fact, while Ulysses was a work in progress, Joyce threatened people that they might be portrayed in a less than flattering light in the book if they didn't behave. And many of his friends were later incensed that he used them as characters in his drama where he had complete control over their behavior. Incidentally, I've also heard the suggestion that the colour yellow referred to the colour vestments a priest would have worn saying Mass on that particular date in the Catholic Church calendar. The Church does have vestments for every day of the year. With James A. Joyce, you never know where he's coming from, and it's advisable to check everything. So I'm sure that's probably accurate about the colour yellow and the vestments. Anyway, here we are. We're on the parapet of this tower, and Buck Mulligan prepares to shave. Mulligan has already mockingly chanted the opening words of the old Latin mass, In Troibo ad altare dei, translation, I will go unto the altar of God. Here come Joyce's next two paragraphs. Halted, he peered down the dark winding stairs and called up coarsely, Come up, Kinch! Come up, you fearful Jesuit! Solemnly he came forward and mounted to the round gun rest. He faced about and blessed gravely thrice the tower, the surrounding country, and the awakening mountains. Just listen to the accuracy of this prose. You can actually see the place, can't you? Then, catching sight of Stephen Didylus, he bent towards him and made rapid crosses in the air, gurgling in his throat and shaking his head. Stephen Didylus, displeased and sleepy, leaned his arms on top of the staircase and looked coldly at the shaking, gurgling face that blessed him equine in its length, and at the light untonsured hair, grained and hued like pale oak. End of quote. I have a bundle of things to unpack here. First of all, look at the word coarsely. In the middle of the word, there's another word. I'll spell it out for your delicate ears. The word A-R-S-E. It's pronounced arse good old Anglo-Saxon, and from it derived the American language term ass, as in James Joyce kicks ass. Do you think that wasn't deliberate? You better believe it was. Joyce was getting his licks in again on Buck Mulligan. Two insults with one word. Excellent man. Now, whom is he calling Kinch? We'll meet that character in a moment, but the word Kinch is exceptionally interesting. In old slang, a Kinch or a Kinchin was the child of a convict or a tramp. And you fearful Jesuit? Well, fearful is one of those words like wicked. A thing could be fearfully good, and the Jesuits were fearfully learned and good at education. And so, here comes Kinch, the fearful Jesuit. His name, as you just heard, is Stephen Didylus, whom Buck Mulligan is mocking and taunting. 
Buck blesses Stephen sardonically as a priest would, and having essentially called him the brat of a criminal or a vagabond, refers ambiguously to Stephen's education at the hands of the Jesuits. Here we come to one of the most important elements in Ulysses and to one of the most significant characters in all literature, the figure of Stephen Dedalus. We can assume that it's the autobiographical James Joyce. Why? Because his earlier novel, A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, is narrated by a character named Stephen Dedalus. And Joyce wasn't exactly bent on concealing his own identity in his work. He openly called it autobiographical. How he arrived at the name is, though, I think quite exciting, because it shows how his convoluted mind worked. This isn't just buried treasure, it's a trove. And Stephen Dedalus, and his character, and his presence in Ulysses, that's the subject of next week's podcast, as we do some more reading and get to know Stephen. Rejoice, Episode 3 Getting to Know Stephen. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. The last two podcasts of James Joyce's Ulysses have been dominated by the notorious mocker, Buck Mulligan. Now we meet the man whom he's been mocking. His name is Stephen, Stephen Dedalus, and we'll be with him on and off for many, many podcasts. You remember from last week that Buck Mulligan, still pretending to be a priest, has made the sign of the cross over Stephen several times. Here's how Joyce continues. Stephen Dedalus, displeased and sleepy, leaned his arms on top of the staircase and looked coldly at the shaking, gurgling face that blessed him. You recall that quote from last week. Now, who is Stephen Dedalus, the depressed, disturbed even young man who wanders in an anxious mood through Dublin on the 16th of June, 1904? We're assuming it's the autobiographical Joyce, and as you probably know, Stephen Dedalus is the artist in the portrait, the protagonist in Joyce's previous novel, A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. The choice of Dedalus, D-E-D-A-L-U-S, as a character's name, is a bunch of references unto itself, so I'll spend some time on it. It's really enjoyable. I'll start with Stephen. The first martyr in the Catholic Church was Saint Stephen, a major figure. And just listen to what was available to Joyce by way of hidden meaning, simply by choosing that name. The word Stephen, from the Greek, means a crown of laurels or a wreath, a sign of recognized glory and praise. Stephen took a stand against the Hebrew high priests, and for his pains he was stoned to death by a mob who had as their cheerleader no less a person than Saul of Tarsus, the same Saul who later fell off his horse on the road to Damascus and became Paul. But... Whereas Paul has to share a feast day with Peter, the 29th of June, it's Stephen whose feast day is closest to Christmas, the birth of Christ. Remember the Christmas carol? Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen, the day after Christmas Day. And Stephen is venerated as a saint and martyr by a number of churches, not just Catholic, Greek Orthodox, Lutheran, Episcopalian, so that Joyce's Stephen was also a kind of everyman, and he was therefore making the point about the universality and the sanctity of literature. Also, Joyce chose the name Stephen after the first Catholic martyr because Joyce, not entirely without a teeny hint of self-absorption maybe and ego, saw himself as martyred by the begrudgery, the narrowness, the bigotry of Ireland, pierced and pinned, he felt, by the arrows that flew at him. And he also wanted to be the first saint in literature. As for Dedalus... Well, I'm sure you already know the name from classical mythology, Daedalus who built wings for his son Icarus, but the boy flew too close to the sun. The wax that glued the feathers melted, and the boy fell to his death in the sea. There's a wonderful poem by W. A. Jordan that touches on the subject. But even though Joyce might himself have felt that he often flew too close to the heat of critical opinion, that's not why he gave his autobiographical self the name Daedalus, which he would go on to use in Ulysses. He had a whole lot else in mind. The word Daedalus in Greek means cunning creator or innovator, and in mythology Daedalus was an architect, an inventor, who could make the statues that he sculpted seem to have life and movement. What is a novelist supposed to do with his or her characters? Give them life and movement. Daedalus was also, they say, the man who invented carpentry. He designed the saw, and he was the architect who built the most famous labyrinth the world has ever heard of at Knossos on the Greek island of Crete, described by Homer in the Iliad like this. Out in the wine-dark sea there lies a land called Crete, a rich and lovely land, washed by the waves on every side. 
Joyce from Ireland, an island watched by the waves on every side, saw himself as the cunning creator. He too built mazes and labyrinths of language. He taunted the world with the complexity of his mind and his prose. In one of his most famous remarks, he said he'd keep the professors busy for 300 years. Completely logical, then, was Daedalus as a character's name, but still pretty damn brilliant to choose a name with so many implications. And on the wings of his writing, James Daedalus Joyce soared above us all. Believe it or not, we're still on page one of Ulysses, and from time to time I'll have to stop, as I've just done, to take stock of and unpack a name or an incident before I can carry on with the reading. Are you beginning to get the complexities of Ulysses? Isn't it terrific? Next week, we'll continue meeting Stephen, who is the intellectual command centre of Ulysses, the head of the novel, if you like, whereas Mr. Bloom, poor Mr. Bloom, whom we'll also meet presently, is the heart of the book. Read Joyce, Episode 4, A Bit of Blasphemy. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. Before I press on, a quick note about this first chapter of Ulysses. It's called Telemachus. The name in Greek means the fighter far from the battle. And this is important. In Homer's Odyssey, on which Joyce configured the structure of Ulysses, Telemachus was the son of Odysseus and Penelope, the son who never met his absent father. And Stephen Daedalus is out on the outskirts of Dublin, far from the daily fray which he will soon enter. Plus, Stephen's quest in Ulysses can be construed, as you'll see, among other things, as the search for a father who will take care of him kindly. One of the great themes of the book is the father-son relationship, so important in Joyce's own life. Right, let's move on. Stephen, still half asleep, has come upstairs onto the flat roof of the Ron Martello Tower at Sandy Cove, south of Dublin. And he's being greeted by the jeering voice and mocking face of his so-called friend Buck Mulligan. Joyce, by the way, describes Buck Mulligan as having a face equine in its length. It's short, a face like a horse. Next words out of Mulligan's mouth, Back to barracks, he said sternly. Now that was an order given to soldiers after their first parade of the day, which was held to check that they'd all come back from the pub the night before, and Mulligan's essentially ordering Stephen back to bed now that he's done his morning appearance and has come back from the pub the night before. Note, by the way, how James Joyce had none of the modern qualms about using adverbs. In Ulysses, they're as numerous as the raisins in a fruitcake. Now begins the difficulty. The stuff that got James A. Joyce, the Catholic boy, the product of a Jesuit school, into deep trouble. The blasphemy in Ulysses is still capable of giving offence to people of devout faith. I'll read the offending paragraph. It's the first of many. He, the Buck Mulligan, added in a preacher's tone, For this, O oh dearly beloved, is the genuine Christine, body and soul and blood and ooms. Slow music, please. Shut your eyes, gents. One moment. A little trouble about those white corpuscles. Silence, all. He peered sideways up and gave a long, low whistle of call, then paused a while in rapt attention, his even white teeth glistening here and there with gold points. Chrysostomos. Two strong, shrill whistles answered through the call. Thanks, old chap, he cried briskly. That will do nicely. Switch off the current, will you? To readers at the time the book was published in 1922, especially in militantly Catholic Ireland, this was appalling. The Buck Mulligan had taken the word Eucharist from the sacrifice of the Mass and substituted the word Christine because the satanic rite of a black Mass was always celebrated on the naked body of a prostitute. Not only that, the core words of the Eucharistic rite are body and blood. This is the sacrifice of the body and blood of Christ. And Mulligan says, body and soul and blood and ooms. It gets worse. The phrase blood and wounds comes from a 17th century profanity. It started life as God's blood and wounds, and slowly became God's blood. I've even heard God's teeth. And then when they dropped God, so to speak, it became blood and wounds, and then blood and wounds. It's the same kind of linguistic progression by which the word bloody descended from the oath by Our Lady. And by the way, the magician's words, hocus pocus, they come from the words the priest intones at the consecration of the Latin mass, hoc est enim corpus meum, for this is my body. Mulligan goes on mocking what happens at mass. Slow music, please, shut your eyes, gents. 
And then he makes a further blasphemous crack about white corpuscles, referring to a little difficulty with the wine turning miraculously into the blood of Christ. Mulligan, by the way, is a medical student. And just a quick note here and a word that you might have noticed standing out in the passage I read. His even white teeth, glistening here and there with gold points, chrysostomos. Now, this is very interesting. Here we have Joyce writing narrative, and we also have Joyce letting us see Stephen's inner thoughts for the first time in what would become the famous device of the book, the interior monologue of the characters. First in narration, he reports Mulligan's teeth with their gold fillings, and then we hear Stephen think the word Chrysostomos. Vintage Joyce, enthralling Ulysses. Stephen, on seeing the gold and the parody of mass and the mocking of a priest, recalls the man with the golden mouth, Pope Gregory the Great, who, it was said, could convert any pagan with his wonderful language. And the whistles? One and then two. This is a mimicry of the bell at the consecration. I rang it many times as an altar boy to tell the congregation in the church that the bread and wine had been transubstantiated into the body and blood of Christ. Next week, Stephen speaks. Read Joyce, Episode 5, The Voice of Stephen. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. For the past few weeks, we've been moving slowly through the first chapter, indeed the first page, of James Joyce's Ulysses. It was necessary to be slow, and it will be again, because of the multitude of deep references to consider. And they get deeper. Now, though, <laughs> we're on to the second page, and let me read the next passage to you. You remember where we are? On the roof of the Martello Tower, Stephen watches Buck Mulligan in a yellow robe astride the old gun rest on this fortification. Here we go. He skipped off the gun rest and looked gravely at his watcher, gathering about his legs the loose folds of his gown. The plump, shadowed face and sullen oval jowl recalled a prelate, patron of the arts in the Middle Ages. A pleasant smile broke quietly over his lips. The mockery of it, he said gaily, your absurd name, an ancient Greek. He pointed his finger in friendly jest and went over to the parapet, laughing to himself. Stephen Dedalus stepped up, followed him wearily halfway, and sat down at the edge of the gun rest, watching him still as he propped his mirror on the parapet, dipped the brush in the bowl, and lathered cheeks and neck. Buck Mulligan's gay voice went on. My name is absurd, too. Maliki Mulligan, two dactyls. But it has a Hellenic ring, hasn't it? Tripping and sunny, like the Buck himself. We must go to Athens. Will you come if I can get the aunt to fork out twenty quid? He laid the brush aside and, laughing with delight, cried, Will he come, the jejune Jesuit? Ceasing, he began to shave with care. Tell me, Mulligan said Stephen quietly. Yes, my love. How long is Haynes going to stay in this tower? Straightforward stuff, a scene at the beginning of a novel where characters and their conflicts are being established. Two important voices in dialogue, no different in structure from thousands of novels the world over. And an insult. Jejun means unsatisfying to the mind or soul, uninteresting, unrewarding in character, meagre. Knowing James Joyce, though, and his love of complexity, is there anything deeper that we should be looking out for? Anything else we should interrogate? I have to be a little careful here, and all through the book. There's an interesting note in Richard Elman's great biography of Joyce, to the effect that not everything in Ulysses can be explained, because Joyce believed that the novel should mirror life itself, in which not everything can always be explained. Nonetheless, I have one or two references. I heard a piece of ancient gossip in Dublin once that Joyce said, Oliver Gogarty, the model for the Buck Mulligan, looked like one of the Borgias, the one who became Pope in the 16th century. That, then, would be the prelate of the Middle Ages with the sullen oval jowl we've just heard about. Now, if Joyce meant that, it was a mighty insult to Gogarty, because the Borgias made the Sopranos look like Sesame Street. The name Joyce chose for his enemy, he'd have been very interested in the new word frenemy, part friend, part enemy. The name he chose, Maliki Mulligan, you just know he meant something by it. Well, he did. It was ironic. There was a high king of Ireland called Maliki, and a saint Maliki, who was a kind of Irish Nostradamus. And as I said somewhere else in these podcasts, but it bears repeating, he wanted to give his character's name the same rhythm as that of his nemesis, Oliver Gogarty, Maliki Mulligan. And now here comes the deeper thought, when the same gent says, but it has a Hellenic ring to it. That's actually much 
of the point of this first chapter. There was, there is, a Martello Tower. It's now the James Joyce Museum. And Joyce did stay there with Gogarty in 1904. Gogarty, whose witty, ironic idea it was to take over the tower and render it classical, make it like Delphi, the great temple in Greece, with Gogarty himself, the oracle. And now the picture begins to clarify. If you haven't seen Delphi, make an opportunity and go. You'll never forget it. I've spent some of the most memorable days of my life there, just walking around the place, soaking it up. Delphi was the shrine to the god Apollo. And from inside a hollow statue, a priest at the shrine, pretending to be a supernatural oracle, would speak to the pilgrims who were paying homage. Joyce first arrived there on the 9th of September, 1904, into this deliberate haven from what he called, in one of his other books, priest-ridden, godforsaken island. And in the tower they had a wild enough time being deliberately disrespectable. Lots of drink, lots of visitors, and one other guest, a man named Trench, who was portrayed in Ulysses as the Englishman named Haynes. Oh, and there was a black panther and a gun, of which more next week. Read Joyce, Episode 6, A Black Panther and a Gun. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. Last week... I left you with Stephen Dedalus saying to Buck Mulligan, How long is Haynes going to stay in this tower? Now read on. Buck Mulligan showed a shaven cheek over his right shoulder. God, isn't he dreadful? He said frankly. A ponderous Saxon. He thinks you're not a gentleman. God, these bloody English, bursting with money and indigestion, because he comes from Oxford. You know, Dedalus, you have the real Oxford manner. He can't make you out. Oh, my name for you is the best. Kinch, the knife blade. He shaved warily over his chin. He was raving all night about a black panther, Stephen said. Where is his gun case? A woeful lunatic, Mulligan said. Were you in a funk? I was, Stephen said, with energy and growing fear. Out here in the dark, with a man I don't know, raving and moaning to himself about shooting a black panther. You saved men from drowning. I'm not a hero, however. If he stays on here, I am off. Okay, here we go. Buck Mulligan and Stephen Dedalus, who, as you know, is modelled on Joyce himself, they're doing that thing the Irish love doing, talking about a third person in their group. Why do conversations last so long in Ireland? Because nobody wants to be the first to leave, because he knows that those he leaves behind will immediately begin gossiping about him. Or so it's said. Here... They're discussing the other guest, Haynes. Haynes, the Englishman. We don't learn much else about him from Joyce, but he was in real life a man called Samuel Chenevy or Chenevix Trench, Anglo-Irish, therefore coming from those tribes planted in Ireland to make the country English and Protestant for an English and Protestant monarch. Neurotic as a cat, Trench irritated Joyce because he had changed his cultural religion, so to speak. He had embraced the poetry, the music, the soul of the native Irish. And Joyce hated people who espoused anything to which, in his opinion, they weren't entitled. So, when Buck Mulligan calls Haynes a ponderous Saxon, he's calling him a boring Englishman, whose biggest claim to distinction is that he has been to Oxford University. And yet, Mulligan pays Stephen the compliment of looking and sounding as if he, Stephen, too, had been to Oxford. You know, Didylus, you have the real Oxford manner. There's also a nod here to the fact that Joyce was, in some ways, quite an opaque individual. He can't make you out, says Mulligan, but earlier he has said, he thinks you're not a gentleman. Now, this is very interesting to me. I lived in London for 25 years, and I was mindful all the time of something a great fellow countryman of mine, George Bernard Shaw, said. In his play, Pygmalion, which, as you know, later became the musical and then the film My Fair Lady, Shaw said, It is impossible for an Englishman to open his mouth without making some other Englishman despise him. The point was about class. By the way he speaks, an Englishman may be socially defined. But with most Irish accents, they had no idea whether you're a prince or a pauper. So, whereas Haynes the Englishman suspected that Stephen Dedalus might not be a gentleman, he can't tell, because Stephen, like Joyce himself, spoke with an educated Dublin accent. Fascinating. And now we come to the Black Panther and the gun. He was raving all night about a Black Panther, Stephen says. Where is his gun case? And Mulligan asks, were you in a funk, meaning were you scared, anxious? Well, yes, but funk is a really interesting word. You know it already, to funk something, to turn back out of fear from something you were going to do. 
Joyce must have loved this word, because it does mean to be cowardly and afraid, but it also means the odour given off in fear, and the same word is used for the sweat odour given off in sex. It's an old word from the Flemish in Belgium, and was there anything that James Joyce loved more than an old word that did several things at once? In real life, though, this is what happened. Gogarty had become irritated with Joyce, who all his life had a, a very superior air. You could argue, well, he was kind of superior. On the night of Wednesday, September the 14th, 1904, Trench, that is, Haynes the Englishman, had a nightmare about a black panther. Still sleeping, he took his gun and fired a shot into the fireplace right beside Joyce's bed and went back to sleep. Joyce was terrified. Gogarty crept across to where Trench was sleeping and took the gun. Wise move. Not long after this, Trench had another nightmare, and this time Gogarty fired the gun deliberately at the pots and pans that were hanging above Joyce's bed and brought them crashing down. Joyce took the hint, rose, and left. Gogarty had found a way to get rid of his conceited friend. But what a price he would pay, and all his life, when Ulysses was eventually published. Next week, Mulligan's gigantic insult. Rejoice, Episode 7, Mulligan's Gigantic Insult. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. Last week we heard how the real-life Buck Mulligan, in the middle of the night, fired a gun at the pots and pans over James Joyce's head in the Martello Tower. Now, in Ulysses, Joyce has Mulligan pile insult and disdain on Joyce's autobiographical character, Stephen Dedalus. Here are the next few paragraphs, and they're not exactly appetizing. Buck Mulligan frowned at the lather on his razor blade. He hopped down from his perch and began to search his trouser pockets hastily. Scutter! he cried thickly. He came over to the gun rest and, thrusting a hand into Stephen's upper pocket, said, Lend us the loan of your nose rag to wipe my razor. Stephen suffered him to pull out and hold up on show by its corner a dirty, crumpled handkerchief. Buck Mulligan wiped the razor blade neatly. Then, gazing over the handkerchief, he said, The bard's nose rag, a new art colour for our Irish poets, snot green. You can almost taste it, can't you? He mounted to the parapet again and gazed out over Dublin Bay, his fair, oak-pale hair stirring slightly. God, he said quietly, isn't the sea what algae calls it, a grey, sweet mother? The snot-green sea, the scrotum-tightening sea, Epi, I know pas pantin, ah, Daedalus the Greeks, I must teach you. You must read them in the original. Talata, Talata, she's our great, sweet mother. Come and look. Stephen stood up and went over to the parapet. Leaning on it, he looked down on the water and on the mailboat clearing the harbour mouth of Kingstown. Our mighty mother, Buck Mulligan said. Right, that's the end of that passage. Not a lot to interrogate there, just a few notes. Kingstown, of course, is now called Dudleary, and I've watched that mailboat to England many a time. First, though, observe Buck Mulligan's aggression towards Stephen. He pulls the handkerchief out of Stephen's breast pocket and wipes his razor with it. Now, admittedly, it wasn't the cleanest handkerchief in the world, but that's not the point. I've been wearing pocket squares in my jackets since I was 20 years old, and if anyone did that to me, there'd be a fire on the moon, that's for sure. Such an invasive act. Second point, Mulligan's contempt for the colour green, which was the rampant and proud colour of Ireland's emerging nationalism. Joyce did not want Irish readers to like Buck Mulligan, the snot-green sea, and even to mention the word scrotum, Priests, bishops, and dainty ladies would have fainted. Third point. Ah, Daedalus, the Greeks, I must teach you. Again, Mulligan is undermining Stephen, who is vastly more educated and learned. As for the Greek quotations, Epi, I know, Perponton, on the wine-dark sea, that means I love this. In the Iliad or the Odyssey, when Homer wants his audience or his storyteller to take a little rest, he uses recurring phrases, the wine-dark sea, or dawn came with rosy fingers. Storytellers all over the world do the same. By the way, there's a delicious little dig in there at Mulligan. He says, I'll remind you of it, isn't the sea what algae calls it a grey sweet mother? Now, the algae was the poet Swinburne who wrote a famous piece, The Triumph of Time, in which there's a line, I will go back to the great sweet mother, mother and lover of men, the sea. I will go down to her, I and none other, Close with her, kiss her, and mix her with me. Note, the word is great, sweet mother. And Joyce has Mulligan misquote, grey, sweet mother. And then, 
he repeats it and gets it right a moment later. And interestingly, Swinburne's poem is full of Eucharistic references just at the moment when Mulligan is parodying the Catholic Mass. The poem itself drew some attention from those who accused Swinburne of blasphemy, as they accused Joyce. Before I forget it, Thalatta is the ancient name for the sea, shouted by 10,000 mercenary Greek soldiers who, tricked into the wrong war, fought their way back from Mesopotamia to the Black Sea and home again to Greece. Give or take a century, we're almost shouting, Sparta! Sparta! Like the 300. And now, in Ulysses, comes the big insult. After Mulligan says, Our mighty mother, this is what happened. Here's the quote. He turned abruptly, his great searching eyes, from the sea to Stephen's face. The aunt thinks you killed your mother, he said. That's why she won't let me have anything to do with you. Someone killed her? Stephen said gloomily. You could have knelt down, damn it, Kinch, when your dying mother asked you, Buck Mulligan said. I'm Hyperborean as much as you, but to think of your mother begging you with her last breath to kneel down and pray for her. And you refused. There's something sinister in you. Ouch. And this is taken from life, because although Joyce was extremely close to his mother and needed her approval, he refused to come back to Catholicism, even when she asked him as she was on her deathbed. He was 21 years old. Oh, Hyperborean or Hyperborean loosely means somebody who coldly lives outside the social norms. And note, by the way, here's a writerly note, the expert fashion in which Joyce's writing introduces the very idea of the word mother before we come to that crucial early moment. Next week, the voice inside Stephen. Rejoice, episode eight, the voice inside Stephen. Hello. I'm Frank Delaney. Last week, we heard how Buck Mulligan just kept ragging Stephen. To think of your mother begging you with her last breath to kneel down and pray for her. And you refused. There's something sinister in you. And then he says that Stephen's refusal effectively killed his mother. Now, read on, so to speak. He, that's Mulligan, he broke off and lathered again lightly his father cheek. A tolerant smile curled his lips. But a lovely mummer, he murmured to himself. Kinch, the loveliest mummer of them all. He shaved evenly and with care, in silence, seriously. Just two quick notes here, because there's a long, complex paragraph coming up. A mummer, including the word mummy, a mummer is a kind of actor, mostly seen in street theatre, by and large informal, and here's the point. A mummer is very often masked. So Buck Mulligan is asserting that Stephen is insincere, that he performs his own life rather than lives it, and that the face he wears every day is, in fact, a mask. Also, mummers weren't serious actors. They gave clownish performances. And the core of a mummer's play very often has to do with the killing of somebody and then bringing them back to life. And we've just been hearing Mulligan's accusation that Stephen effectively killed his mother by his failure to honour her deathbed wishes. Incidentally, do you remember how Joyce has described Mulligan? An equine face, he said, and hair the colour of pale oak. So is Mulligan a false friend, therefore a Trojan horse? He sure is. Second short note here, the language, I'll repeat it. A lovely mummer, mummy of course being another word for mother. A lovely mummer, he murmured, the loveliest mummer of them all. He shaved evenly and with care, in silence, seriously. Mmm sounds and s sounds. This, and you'll hear this from me over and over, this supports my thesis that one way to crack open Ulysses is to read it as a long, long poem. Next paragraph. Listen carefully, because this is where we begin the long and winding road into Stephen's mind. This is where we get the flavour and the texture of his all-important inner voice. Stephen, an elbow rested on the jagged granite, leaned his palm against his brow and gazed at the fraying edge of his shiny black coat sleeve. Pain that was not yet the pain of love fretted his heart, Silently, in a dream, she had come to him after her death, her wasted body within its loose brown grave clothes, giving off an odour of wax and rosewood, her breath that had bent upon him mute, reproachfully, a faint odour of wetted ashes. Across the threadbare cuff edge he saw the sea, hailed as a great sweet mother 
by the well-fed voice beside him. The ring of bay and skyline held a dull green mass of liquid. A bowl of white china had stood beside her deathbed, holding the sluggish green bile which she had torn up from her rotting liver by fits of loud, groaning vomiting. All kinds of stuff going on here. Dublin Bay as a bowl. Stephen's gone introvert. We're told this by the way he looks at his sleeve. And we also know he's not exactly the smartest of sartorialists or the richest. His jacket sleeve is frayed and shiny. And the line, pain that was not yet the pain of love, doesn't that line, though appropriate to Stephen's bereft feelings, doesn't it also have the feel of a quotation? It does. And, as Joyce was a fine singer who took part in contests, he will certainly have heard the French art song, Plaisir d'Amour. And he will also have heard many subsequent recorded versions. You may know it. The pleasure of love lasts for just a moment. The pain of love endures your whole life long. Here's another point. To write Ulysses, Joyce drew on a vocabulary of just over 30,000 words, and of these, 16,000 or so appear only once, only once in the novel. The word pain appears 19 times, and the word love 163 times, and the first time we see either, they appear together in the same sentence in the first chapter. As to his mother appearing in his dreams in loose brown grave clothes, that was the famous brown shroud, or habit as it was also called, that was popular for Catholic funerals in those days. But Joyce, in real life, took things farther than that. On the night his mother died, he and his sister rose at midnight in the hope and fear of seeing her ghost. And the well-fed voice, well, we already know that Mulligan is plump, because now he's well fed, and Stephen himself is wearing frayed and threadbare clothes worn to a black shine. But, 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 we have now touched a major theme here, one that will surface again and again in Ulysses, and indeed will presently occupy entire podcasts and recur frequently. Like some magical railway line, direct and powerful connections run between James Joyce's Ulysses and William Shakespeare's Hamlet, who dreamed of and saw the ghost of his dead father. So, next week, we go forward to meet Joyce's Hamlet. Rejoice, Episode 9, James Joyce's Hamlet. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. It's only slightly less than exact to say that Joyce was obsessed with Shakespeare's most famous character. And as we go on with these podcasts, you'll see how much he thought about him and spent a lifetime thinking about Shakespeare and Hamlet and the themes therein. For example, in the winter of 1912, when he was 30 years old, Joyce, who was living in Trieste in Italy, gave a dozen public lectures on Monday nights on the subject of Hamlet. In Ulysses, he creates many correspondences between Stephen and the Prince of Denmark, and here, in the first chapter, we have now come to the first of them. In Shakespeare's play, Hamlet is on the battlements of Elsinore Castle when he sees the ghost of his murdered father. In Ulysses, Stephen is standing by the actual gun rest on the roof of this fortification near Dublin, the Martello Tower, when he thinks about his dead mother. In Hamlet, there's a usurper, Claudius, who pretends to be friendly to the young prince. In Ulysses, there's the false friend, Buck Mulligan. Furthermore, here's Stephen a young man assailed by all kinds of doubts and fears, with a dead and ghostly parent, trying to deal with Buck Mulligan's rapier thrusts of wit. And Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, also a young man, and assailed by all kinds of doubts and fears, with a dead and ghostly parent, and trying to deal with Laertes's actual rapier thrusts. The connections between the novel Ulysses and the play Hamlet will spark into life again and again and again. It was conscious on Joyce's part, and provided you live long enough, there's a wonderful moment near the end of the novel when Stephen is down among the brothels of Dublin in the chapter called Night Town, and in one electrifying moment, the entire Shakespeare theme comes to life in a fabulous and moving and uncanny way. But we're 17 or 18 years away from that, so let's push on. We're still in chapter one. Buck Mulligan is still shaving. Here's the next piece of text. Buck Mulligan wiped again his razor blade. Ah, poor dog's body, he said in a kind voice. 
I must give you a shirt and a few nose rags. How are the second-hand breeks? They fit well enough, Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan attacked the hollow beneath his underlip. The mockery of it, he said contentedly. Second leg they should be. God knows what poxy bowsy left them off. I have a lovely pair with a stripe grey. You look spiffing in them. I'm not joking, Kinch. You look damn well when you're dressed. Thanks, Stephen said. I can't wear them if they're grey. <laughs> he can't wear them, Buck Mulligan told his face in the mirror. Etiquette is etiquette. He kills his mother, but he can't wear grey trousers. He folded his razor neatly, and with stroking palps of fingers felt the smooth skin. Just look at how much Joyce tells us in this short paragraph. Walk through it with me, point by point. First, dog's body. Ah, poor dog's body. Contemptuous, with a hint of blasphemy. A dog's body is a lackey, a servant, a menial person doing menial tasks. There's another insult. Stephen is far too educated for that. Nor is he naturally, by appearance, demeanour or style, anyone's dog's body. The blasphemy? Well, you recall how I told you that the opening words of Ulysses, stately, the opening word, echoes the closing word, yes, with the placement of the letters Y, E, and S in stately. Dog's body equals God's body, and the body of Christ is the cornerstone of the Catholic Mass that Buck Mulligan has been mocking. And look at the patronising tone of Mulligan, to whom Stephen is way superior intellectually. He offers to give Stephen a shirt and some handkerchiefs, and then piles it on by asking Stephen about the second-hand pants he's wearing, which is all Stephen can afford. Second leg, as in second-hand, is a typical Joyce word joke. A poxy bowsy is a Dublin lowlife, a scumbag with a venereal disease who shouts suggestive comments at passing ladies. And finally, Stephen can't accept Mulligan's offer of grey striped pants. Why? Because he will be in mourning for a year and a day, and can only wear black, according to tradition. The point here? Who else insists on wearing black after the death of a parent? Hamlet. Claudius, the usurping king of Denmark, who has killed Hamlet's father, asks Hamlet to cast thy knighted colour off. But Hamlet, like Stephen, insists on wearing his customary suits of solemn black. Next week... Is Stephen insane? Rejoice, episode 10. Is Stephen insane? Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. Here's the relevant text for this week's chapter, the first paragraph. Stephen turned his gaze from the sea and to the plump face with its smoke-blue mobile eyes. That fellow I was in the ship with last night, said Buck Mulligan, says you have GPI. He's up in Dottyville with Connolly Norman. General paralysis of the insane. End of quote. Buck Mulligan had been drinking the previous night in a pub in central Dublin called The Ship. It was at Lower Abbey Street, right in the middle of the city, and we'll come to it again presently. What Buck Mulligan is saying is that he met a fellow who works in a Dublin psychiatric hospital. Its nickname was Dottyville, for obvious reasons. And this fellow, probably another medical student like Mulligan himself, he was part of the team under a man by name of Connolly Norman, who was, in fact, the head of that hospital in 1904. By the way, and you love this, there was at that time in Ireland, under British rule, a government department called the Office of Lunacy. And there were civil servants there whose title was Inspector of Lunatics. General paralysis of the insane was a euphemism for saying that somebody had syphilis, which in its final stages was believed to cause derangement and insanity. So there's another massive insult from Buck Mulligan to Stephen. And here's the next piece of text. He, that's Buck Mulligan, he swept the mirror a half circle in the air to flash the tidings abroad in sunlight now radiant on the sea. His curling, shaven lips laughed, and the edges of his white, glittering teeth. Laughter seized all his strong, well-knit trunk. Look at yourself, he said, you dreadful bard. Stephen bent forward and peered at the mirror held out to him, cleft by a crooked crack. Hair on end, as he and others see me. Who chose this face for me? 
this dog's body to rid of vermin. It asks me to. Now that's fairly straightforward stuff, or is it? First, the idea of using the mirror as a signalling device to tell the world of Stephen's alleged and totally untrue venereal disease. That's plain enough. Mirrors and lamps were used to flash signals at sea. Also, the phrase, his curling lips, is another nautical reference. It suggests Buck Mulligan as a pirate. And here's the whole sentence again, and I want you to watch the structure. His curling, shaven lips laughed, and the edges of his white, glittering teeth. I love this. I love it. Because at first, when you read it, on the page, you get the impression that there might be a word missing, that it should be, as did the edges of his white, glittering teeth. But for all his seeming prolixity, Joyce is savagely economical with language. Try to edit him, and you'll soon see that. And the sentence, therefore, is, his curling, shaven lips laughed, and the edges of his white, glittering teeth, meaning they laughed too, the teeth. Next piece of text, and if I read it slowly, you'll see that I'm reading what Stephen is thinking. Look at yourself, he said, you dreadful bard. Stephen bent forward and peered at the mirror held out to him, cleft by a crooked crack. That's clear enough. Now come the thoughts, and that's why I'm repeating it. Hair on end, as he and others see me, who chose this face for me? This dog's body to rid of vermin, it asks me to... Essentially, Stephen doesn't like how he looks, and he wants to be finished with Mulligan. And one more paragraph. This is a new paragraph. I pinched it out of the skivvy's room, Buck Mulligan said. It does her all right. The aunt always keeps plain-looking servants from Malachy. Lead him not into temptation, and her name is Ursula. Malachy, of course, is Buck Mulligan's full name. He stole the mirror from the room of his aunt's maid. Get hold of the word skivvy. It comes from a Japanese word, skibai meaning a randy or lecherous individual, almost certainly meaning a Japanese hooker. And that becomes translated into skivvy, which is a derogatory term for a household maid, who in that same derogation was thought to be sexually available to the men of the household and who also did all the menial work. And the term skivvy was also used in slang for U.S. servicemen's underwear. Note, too, the chauvinistic sexism. Mulligan's aunt kept a plain-looking maid so that her nephew would be not tempted to seduce or be seduced. Lead him not into temptation, is a quotation, of course, from the Lord's Prayer. And her name is Ursula, he says. St. Ursula, as Joyce, the Jesuit-educated Catholic, would be well aware, was a major virgin from 3rd or 4th century Britain, who led a pilgrimage of 11,000 virgins across Europe, and who was a byword in the Catholic Church when the question of virginity arose, as it did very often indeed. That's all for this week. Next week, a cracked looking glass. Rejoice, episode 11, a cracked looking glass. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. We're still on the roof of the Martello Tower, Buck Mulligan has finished shaving, but he hasn't finished insulting and taunting Stephen, who has just looked at his own face in Mulligan's mirror. Here's the next piece of text, and we'll be spending all this week's broadcast on it. Laughing again, he brought the mirror away from Stephen's peering eyes. The rage of Caliban at not seeing his face in a mirror, he said. If Wilde were only alive to see you. Drawing back and pointing, Stephen said with bitterness, it is a symbol of Irish art, the cracked looking glass of a servant. End of quote. The servant, of course, was Ursula, as you heard last week, Mulligan's aunt's housemaid, from whose room Mulligan had stolen the mirror. And now we dive into a deep pool where we swim with William Shakespeare and Oscar Wilde. Oscar Fingol O'Flaherty Wills Wilde. For somewhat more than the sheer pleasure of it, I'm going to quote from the preface to Wilde's famous piece, The Picture of Dorian Gray. If you've ever read it, you won't have forgotten it, and you'll know its place in what I'd almost call urban legend, how a young man about town, a society rake, is prepared to sell his soul to keep his looks, so that he can go on living the dissolute life that he loves and to which he's addicted, and how his deterioration into debauchery will only be reflected in the portrait of himself that he keeps in his attic. It is, of course, much more than a story, as Wilde's observation that the Victorians were too hypocritical to look at themselves honestly. And I'm going to quote from the preface, and that's how we get to Shakespeare. Wilde said, in that preface to the picture of Dorian Gray, There is no such thing as a moral or an immoral book. 
Books are well written or badly written, that is all. The 19th century dislike of realism is the rage of Caliban seeing his own face in a glass. The 19th century dislike of romanticism is the rage of Caliban not seeing his own face in a glass. No artist is ever morbid. The artist can express everything. End of quote. Caliban, as you probably know, is the ridiculous, drunken, deformed, foot-licking, betraying servant monster in Shakespeare's play The Tempest. And I mustn't digress into my love for that particular piece, or we'll be here all day. Caliban is a kind of anagram for the word cannibal. He is the son of the devil witch Sycorax, and he lorded the island before Prospero the wizard landed there and took over the place, and with his magic reduced Caliban to an unsightly misshapen servant. By the way, you can argue that Shakespeare was a couple of hundred years ahead of his time, because in the figure of Caliban, he might also have been making a comment, I think, on the slavery of the black peoples of the world. There's a word, K-A-L-I-B-A-N, in Romani languages, or Calban, or Calben, and it means dark or black. By including the reference to Oscar Wilde here, look, though, at how much James Joyce achieves. It's marvellous. If we, the readers, have bothered to unpack the reference, we get Oscar Wilde's full broadside about art. He's really taking on the Victorians here. He's saying they won't look at the real world because they'll find how it reflects them distasteful in the extreme, and they're too coarse to appreciate art anyway. Their failure to appreciate life's finer side was the kind of theme Oscar Wilde loved to pursue, and it's no less relevant today, to put it mildly. Now, let's have a look at what Joyce does with this. Here again is the final part of the paragraph. Drawing back and pointing, Stephen said with bitterness, it is a symbol of Irish art, the cracked looking glass of a serpent. Well, the cracked looking glass does at least two practical things here. Typical Joyce. It distorts Stephen's own face when he looks in the mirror. But it also gives him multiple images of himself. Metaphorically, it at least represents the fractured view of art prevalent in Irish society, in Joyce's opinion. And it's again a reference from Wilde, who more than once discussed the idea of life imitating art. But if art is a mirror reflecting life, Wilde had argued, it would reduce the position of genius to, what? A cracked looking glass. So, James Joyce, in Ulysses, is preparing us early for his own specific attitude to Irish art, and to Irish coarseness, and perhaps his own feeling as to how Ireland treated his genius, a topic on which he was not modest, he once compared himself to a fine stag torn down by hounds. Way to go, Jim. Rejoice, episode 12, The Schmoozing Buck. Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. As you know, Buck Mulligan, who, by the way, in later real life, the man on whom Joyce based the character, I mean, became a senator in the Irish Parliament, Buck has been goading Stephen quite unpleasantly. Do we now detect a change of tone, a touch of schmooze? Here's the text. Buck Mulligan suddenly linked his arm in Stephen's and walked with him round the tower, his razor and mirror clacking in his pocket where he had thrust them. It's not fair to tease you like that, Kinch, is it? he said kindly. God knows you have more spirit than any of them. Parried again. He fears the lancet of my art, as I fear his, the cold steel pen. Cracked, looking glass of a servant, tell that to the oxy chap downstairs, and touch him for a guinea. He's stinking with money, and he thinks you're not a gentleman. His old fella made his tin by selling jalap to Zulus, or some bloody swindler or other. End of quote. First of all, note again. Joyce's descriptive gift. You can actually hear the mirror and the razor making a noise in Mulligan's pocket as he swings along. Could Joyce have chosen a better word than clacking? I think not. And over and over you'll hear me saying on these broadcasts what a great selector he was of the most used, the most appropriate, the most useful word, the most accurate word. It's not fair to tease you, he says, but what else has he been doing? And is he now regretting it? He praises Stephen for his spirit, and we hear Stephen's internalised observation. Parried again. He fears the lancet of my art. That's one of the best-known sentences in Ulysses. And again, we get a few hidden meanings here. Parried is obviously a fencing term, thrust and parry. Stephen knows he's been fencing with Mulligan and on the defensive, which is why one parries. Its original meaning was to ward off a blow. The lancet of my art. Well... First of all, Mulligan is a medical student. 
And indeed, Gogarty, his real-life model, became a famous surgeon. Is there a sharper instrument than a surgeon's lancet used to make incisions in the skin, in the flesh? And yes, there's a parry in this too, because a lancet is, by definition, a small lance. And thus, there's a suggestion that if these were knights jousting, Mulligan's lance wasn't very big. And when Stephen reflects that Mulligan fears the lancet of Stephen's art, what is that instrument? The cold steel pen. The pen is mightier than the sword. There's the foretest, and I guess the proof that Joyce was going to lampoon Gogarty by portraying him as Buck Mulligan. Now, Mulligan schmoozes on. He goes on further to encourage Joyce. He suggests that Haynes, the Englishman, who slept in the tower the previous night and is still downstairs, might actually pay Stephen for that Oscar Wilde reference we had last week, the cracked looking dust of a servant. Mulligan says, Tell that to the oxy chap downstairs and touch him for a guinea. The term oxy, Haynes has been to Oxford, but Mulligan thinks he's also something of a dumb ox, and touch him for a guinea. That word comes from Guinea in West Africa, because when the coin was struck in 1663 for use in trade with Guinea, it was made from gold found in Guinea. Now, Listen to this. One of the things you notice over and over in Ulysses is how often Joyce made sure that his references didn't stand alone. Here's what I mean. In the line, in the line after the one containing the word guinea, I love this stuff, comes the word gentleman. Haynes thinks Stephen is not a gentleman. Well, here comes Joyce. The guinea was known as the currency of gentlemen. Nobody knows about guineas anymore, except fans of horse racing. There are English classics races with names like the 2,000 guineas, because that used to be the size of the prize. It's an interesting word. In currency, it was actually a pound and a shilling, 21 shillings, and it had a stated, deliberate elegance to it. Auctioneers sold land and art in guineas, and they may, I think, even still sell racehorses in guineas. A golden guinea was indeed a handsome coin. In the swashbuckling yarns of my boyhood, ransoms were always paid in guineas, and mostly in golden guineas. Mulligan goes on to use another interesting word in his scathing comments about Haynes the Englishman. He says, His old fellow made his tin by selling jalap to Zulus or some bloody swindle or other. Old fellow is a true Dublin term. One's father was the old fellow, or the old lad, not totally respectful. Jalap was a laxative. Some say the plant from which it is derived came from Jalapa in Mexico. Others say not, it was Jalapa Guatemala, although there does seem to be agreement that the word actually was in the Aztec lexicon. And Mulligan is also taking a swipe at British colonialism, saying that Haynes's father was selling laxatives to uneducated tribesmen in Africa. Now, in the next line of Mulligan's remark to Stephen, and we come to it next week, there's a really interesting reference, the word Hellenize. In the meantime, let me alert you, here on Friday, we're putting up the first of our Baker's Dozen broadcasts. Every 12 broadcasts, we'll have an extra, a bonus, a departure from the text of Ulysses into the surrounding Joycean hinterland. Don't forget, it's up on Friday morning. Read Joyce, episode 13. Is it all Greek to you? Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. In last week's episode, we had Buck Mulligan schmoozing Stephen, and there was the hint that he might be getting slightly afraid of Stephen, whom he had insulted too much. Their exchange, I'll remind you, went on. God, Kinch, says Mulligan, if you and I could only work together, we might do something for the island. Hellenize it. Well, now, here we go. Hellenize a word of significant complications, and a slew of the kind of multifaceted references that Joyce loved to use. Whether you know it or not, you have to some extent been Hellenized. How? Primary example. If you live in a democracy, you are de facto Hellenized. If you subscribe to the idea of democracy, you have been thoroughly Hellenized. Hellas, meaning ancient and modern Greece. Democracy comes from two words and the political system they describe, all in existence in Greece four centuries before the birth of Christ. Demos, meaning people, and kratos, meaning power. In 508 BC, the people of Athens were being cruelly ruled by a tyrannical overlord. In fact, they'd had a history of tyrants, but this one was evicting them from their homes. 
When enough was soon enough, they rebelled, and they forced their bad rulers into a siege in the Acropolis, and then banished them. They invited back a man by name of Cleisthenes, who himself had been banished by the tyrant. Cleisthenes was the grandson of a really lousy tyrant, and he now decided that was it. No more tyrants. He set up a political system based not on the power of the old moneyed classes who had led Athens into the mess in the first place, but based on where people lived. Hence the beginning of democracy as we know it. So, when Buck Mulligan is saying to Stephen that they should Hellenize the island of Ireland, remember that they lived under the British crown, so his remark was to some degree seditious, although it really had to do with the power of the individual, but at the same time, that would have removed the word subject, as in a subject of the crown. So, same difference, sedition. Well, that's at first glance. But, of course, Joyce always wants to have everything at least both ways. So there's another implication of the word Hellenize, and a much more complex one. And you know this when you read past the remark, and three paragraphs later in Ulysses you come across the name Matthew Arnold, and you say to yourself, Aha! Matthew Arnold was a major 19th century man of letters, as they used to be called, a poet, essayist, teacher, thinker. I don't know how widely he's taught today, but every school-going person of my day knew his poem Dover Beach. The sea is calm tonight, it begins. The tide is full. The moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand glimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window. Sweet is the night air. As a poet, Arnold was up against some superstars of the day. Alfred Lord Tennyson, Robert Browning, and in the United States, Henry Wordsworth Longfellow was a rock star, but Arnold's reputation as a critic set him up in his own right, and Buck Mulligan was referring to one of Arnold's most famous commentaries, Culture and Anarchy, which he published in 1869. This was a discussion, essentially, on the best way to live. Put very simply, this is, this is so interesting, put very simply, Matthew Arnold's argument was that we approach everything mechanically, that we solve our problems as we've always done, without any really deep thought. Whereas, he argued that if we used culture as our tool, if we used as our guides the works of the best thinkers and artists, we'd begin to get new ideas, and thereby we'd stop living mechanically. So, Mulligan was also suggesting to Stephen Dedalus that a continuing awareness and embracing of the bright and enlightened time that was ancient Greece would benefit Ireland. And he had already, as I said in an earlier episode, he'd already suggested that the Martello Tower, where they were living for the moment, would become as important a temple to Ireland as the great shrine of Delphi was to ancient Greece. And it wasn't entirely tongue-in-cheek, although it was impertinent. Put more directly, and this implication is to be found all through Joyce's works, the Irish in general were the living example of a word Matthew Arnold made famous, Philistines meaning essentially barbarians when it came to culture. Joyce really believed that. And you see, there's another hint at a buried reference. The Philistines became synonymous with barbarianism and hostility to the good and aesthetic things of life because their men were uncircumcised and they made war repeatedly on the Israelites of biblical times and on the Egyptians too. Indeed, they were nothing more and nothing less than a bunch of attackers and invaders. The buried reference, though, that's Homeric because in common with the beliefs of the day, Joyce would have known that the Philistines came from the island of Crete. And in Homer's Odyssey, who lives on Crete? The one-eyed Cyclops, whom in Ulysses, Joyce depicts as the ultimate Philistine, the man with only one point of view, his own. We'll meet him one day. Isn't James A. Joyce something? All in one word, Hellenize. Can you believe it? Rejoice, episode 14. What's in a name? Hello, I'm Frank Delaney. In last week's episode, we had just one word, Hellenize. This week, we have some names, Cranley, Kempthorpe, Seymour. Let's continue with the text. Buck Mulligan, having launched many javelins into Stephen's heart, is now trying to mollify him. He has taken Stephen by the arm and is leading him on a little sociable walk around the flat roof of the Martello Tower. The first words you'll hear are in Stephen's inner voice, then I'll read Buck Mulligan's remarks. Cranley's arm, his arm. 
And to think of your having to beg from these swine. I'm the only one that knows what you are. Why don't you trust me more? What have you up your nose against me? Is it Haynes? If he makes any noise here, I'll bring down Seymour, and we'll give him a ragging worse than they gave Clive Kempthorpe. End of quote. Now here's the first name, Cranley. Cranley's arm. In a portrait of the artist as a young man, Joyce's novel before Ulysses, Cranley has sleepy eyes and calls people names like Stinkpot and Go by the Wall and Blasphemous Bloody Ox. Cranley is one of the most crucial characters in a portrait of the artist, if not the most crucial. He's the one who asks Stephen the questions by which we get to know what's inside Stephen's soul, the most important part of the book, questions about love, faith, and family. And when Cranley has seduced Stephen into confiding, he then withdraws his affections, he pulls back. It's one of the most stunning relationships in all literature, especially between two men, and in essence, it only lasts a few pages. But Joyce uses it to characterize the entire work. It's to the character of Cranley that Stephen Dedalus, a.k.a. James Joyce, makes the most profound statements about himself. Remember this? I will tell you, says Stephen, what I will do, and what I will not do. I will not serve that in which I no longer believe, whether it calls itself my home, my fatherland, or my church. And I will try to express myself in some mode of life or art as freely as I can, using for my defense the only arms I allow myself to use, silence, exile, and cunning. It's possibly the most famous passage, he wrote, and thereby James Joyce became a beacon of fire for generations of us. In real life, Cranley was a man by name of J.F. Byrne, who as a student had a deep and complex relationship with Joyce. They confided in each other and went about a lot together, hence Cranley's arm, with the added meaning here that Joyce and Byrne fell out. Joyce believed that Byrne had betrayed him by showing private correspondence to another more malicious friend, and in fact, on the very night that Joyce decided to break or suspend his friendship with Byrne, he met Gogarty, the Buck Mulligan. Now, if you're disposed to find people faults, and Joyce was, in Trump's, well, that was out of the frying pan and into the fire, in Joyce's terms anyway. Because, as he once linked arms with Cranley, he's now linking arms with Buck Mulligan, who's already showing signs of malice and false friendship. Mulligan has another dig at Stephen in the next sentence, at how broke and therefore humiliated Stephen is, and to think of your having to beg from these swine. Now, that's very Irish, and it's pure Dublin malice. Insult, pretending to be concern. And then he has the gall to claim exclusive friendship. I am the only one that knows what you are, by the way. Note the grammatical retaliation. Joyce has Buck Mulligan say, that knows who you are, instead of who knows what you are. Then comes the whine. Why don't you trust me more? What have you up your nose against me? and the deliberate, willful misunderstanding of why Stephen might be annoyed at him. Is it Haynes, he asks. If he makes any noise here, I'll bring down Seymour, and we'll give him a ragging worse than they gave Clive Kempthorpe. In other words, it's the presence of Haynes, the Englishman in the tower, and not Mulligan's own insults that have upset Stephen, or so Mulligan would have Stephen believe, and have us believe. Let's look at the names. All through Ulysses, Joyce brings in people's names without explanation. This is the first time he does it. I'll bring down Seymour, and we'll give him a ragging worse than they gave Clive Kempthorpe, student life. Neither Seymour nor Kempthorpe get much further showing. Seymour is mentioned twice more, and Kempthorpe never again. And we have to assume that they were students of Joyce's or Mulligan's acquaintance. There were Seymours in Ireland at the time, very probably cousins or descendants of the same family as the Jane Seymour, who was one of the wives of King Henry VIII. And there was a Kempthorpe in the Irish Coast Guard service in the late 19th century. So one of that family could have been at university in Dublin at the same time. The word ragging? Well, that's a student word. To rag somebody is to haze them, put them through some kind of rowdy initiation ceremony. In this case, a debagging, removing the fellow's pants. And that's what I'll come back to next week.